Hi, I'm Andrew Mallory and welcome to The Green Economy. I'm Don McCoy. I'm American. And I'm British. And welcome to the show. Welcome to this episode of The Green Economy. Today we'll travel to Condon, Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. This area is going to have the largest wind farm in the world? That's correct. We'll learn all about green wind energy and what it means to the local economy. And I'll travel to the very top of a 200-foot windmill. Beautiful view out here. To see what secrets turn wind into power. This is Condon, Oregon. This is a rural community that's about to completely transform itself. Wind power, sustainable alternative energy. Harnessing the wind for its power is nothing new. For decades, farmers have used windmills for irrigation and milling. But in the 1970s and 80s, utilizing this natural resource to create electricity became the next big thing. Now with the green economy in full swing, power companies and farming communities like Condon are going big with wind energy. With its home in Gilliam County, the area borders the Columbia Gorge, known for its powerful and constant year-round wind. The rest of Gilliam County benefits by high elevations and close proximity to the Pacific Ocean and Cascade Range. Condon will be forever transformed by the green economy. Before the wind, we were basically a wheat and cattle farming community. When the farm prices were down, the business, local businesses didn't see any profit either. And farming hasn't been all that great in re recent years, so the need to diversify is very, very big in our counties. Well, Judge Shaw, it sounds like there's money blowing in the wind everywhere. Is it bringing green collar jobs to Gilliam County? Well, blowing in the wind is a good term, but yes, it is bringing green jobs. During the construction process, there's probably up to 200 people coming in through the town. And then beyond construction, each wind farm employs about six to eight people. So I would guess that there's 40 full-time jobs in this county alone. We have at least two more wind farms coming. Uh, one is of about 700 megawatts that will be in Gillum County. That's going to create a lot more jobs. In fact, I understand this area is going to have the largest wind farm in the world? That's correct. That puts you on the map. How does it make you feel? Feels good. Feels very good. We spoke with Dr. Stell Walker of Oregon State University, a wind power expert, on why Oregon is such a great place for wind energy. My name is Stell Walker. I'm the associate head of the School of Mechanical Industrial Manufacturing Engineering. Quiet and unassuming, Dr. Walker is famous in the wind industry for his study of maximizing windmill performance. I started studying wind energy when I came back to graduate school in 1972. First of all, I started working to develop the aerodynamic performance codes for horizontal axis wind turbines, which has been used throughout the industry for decades now. Over the years, he has become a leading expert of wind patterns utilized in wind energy for the Pacific Northwest. The topography of the Northwest is unique in that we do have the Cascade Mountain Range, which is a relatively high range of mountains up to 10,000 feet that sort of block flow towards the east. And so the air tends to want to go through gaps and, and passes. Air flow through the Columbia Gorge through right here accelerates and continues out over past Kennewick. The wind farms further south like Condon is getting a lot of flow between Mount Hood and Mount Jefferson. Oregon is relatively untapped for wind energy, mainly because several challenges stand in the way. There's other areas of Oregon that also have wind potential, but lack uh, some transmission access, which can be very expensive. And so those will be developed maybe sometime in the distant future. With all of his years in wind energy research, he's realistic about the future of this green power source. Wind energy 
is just one source of energy that we need to satisfy our energy demands until some other source of energy can be developed. Every little bit helps. So wind is not the total answer. Solar is not the total answer. Biofuels and all this other stuff. But all together, they help. We next sat down with Earl and Laura Pryor, veteran farmers near Condon who now have over 60 windmills on their property. We wanted to get their perspective on what it means to go green. How many acres is your farm? We are about 12,000 acres. 12,000 acres. And predominantly you had wheat and cattle? Yes. And so at what point did you decide to enter in to this business decision or you're just happy that it's part of the environment? What is it? Well, I think it's part of the search for more energy. Wind is for zero. The energy is there, all you got to do is capture it. This isn't new. They're just applying a new technology to something that's hundreds, thousands of years old. Before a windmill farm goes in, a wind company will test several farms over a 12 to 24 month period. If conditions are favorable, then a contract is made with the landowner to lease their land for wind towers. It had never occurred to the priors that their land might be more profitable beyond farming until a few years ago, a wind company approached several farms in the county. They were just searching for the best wind sites. Looked at your elevation, and they went out and put up the wind gauges and went from there. And everybody was holding their breath wondering <laughs> who would was going to be the lucky ones to get the first project. Carrying rabbit's feet, sacrificing goats, <laughs> hoping. <laughs> <laughs> At what point now does the community really get to benefit from this? It helps stabilize the base of the economy to a degree for the farms. In addition, wind generation can preserve a community for generations. Pattern in, in rural communities over the years has been the kids getting an education and going somewhere else. As they get older and they start raising children of their own, they think they want to come home because they don't all want to leave. As their wind farm has grown, the priors have hit a ceiling on the number of turbines for their property. This is not due to limited land, but something much larger in scope. In order to really capitalize on the wind power or solar or whatever you're going to do, we're pretty well maxed out in that grid right now. So as a people in this country, what are we going to be willing to buy into? So there's more than one level of this. A lot further reaching than people would expect. It is. So that's significant. If people think that they just might be a likely candidate to be a wind power generating piece of property, they'd better look at their distance from the main power lines because that's yes. what they have to feed into in order to get it to the grid. Yes. So, would you do it all over again if you had the chance? I asked him this once. <laughs> <laughs> During the uh, uh, high point of the project, I said, hell no. <laughs> there you have it, folks. They were certainly a, a pain to farm <laughs> Using the wind to generate electricity goes back more than 100 years, but it wasn't until 1979 when the modern wind power industry truly began. Wind turbines are now popping up all around the world as a means to generate green power. An average wind farm will put out 100 megawatts. With the advancement in technology, the wind turbines get bigger and more powerful, some reaching up to 250 to 300 feet in height. The wind farm in Condon is managed by AES Wind Generation, a global green company based in Texas. After construction, a windmill farm will employ a small maintenance crew, usually from the local population. With the Condon Wind Complex, this includes Randy Carnine, born and raised on a wheat farm just a few miles away. 
So how did you get involved in wind energy? Well, I had a friend that was working out here at one time and he uh, told me to come out here and apply and I applied and got the job out here. So what's the day in the life of uh, Randy? From uh, greasing and filling up oil, we can always uh, check accumulators, a lot of things up there we can do, false resets and any type of things for these turbines. Randy, what's the maximum output of this farm? Well, our farm here puts out about 50 uh, megawatts per hour. And that equates to what in terms of people's understanding? That can do about probably 50,000 homes a year. Power wow. 50,000 homes. How do you build one of these things? Well, it starts with the foundation and uh, <clears throat> they got to do a lot of soil tests and see how deep they got to go into our soil. So and some of these would go down how far? Average out here is probably about 14 to 22 feet deep. And how long does it take to build the whole thing? If the foundation is poured, you probably do about two days putting up all the sections and then putting on the nacelle and the blade. How do you adjust the windmill to accommodate the different flows and different strengths of wind? They will automatically face themselves into the wind. They uh, have a brain up there that tells them to point right directly into the wind and always try to catch the most wind that they can. Whether rain or shine, summer or winter, Randy is the faithful windmill maintenance man, making sure we get our green power. I like my job, I love being in the heights. Don't scare me at all, don't bother me. Very fun. It's interesting to be able to climb up 200 feet and do your job every day. Eastern Oregon is one of the few places left on earth where you feel you've stepped into an old Louis L'Amour novel with arid valleys, cathedral palisades, and cattle ranches reaching across thousands of acres. But it's here that green power is making its next move. Ranches and wheat farmers looking to diversify their income have signed contracts with wind companies to explore their lands for potential wind farm sites. I'm here in Central Oregon in a very rural community. In fact, I'm standing on a cattle ranch that is seriously looking at some alternative forms of income. I'm joined today by Phil from Wilson Ranch. He's the owner. This ranch has been in his family now for five generations. Phil, what made you start looking at alternative? Uh, primarily it was the economics that were driving us more towards green energy. What's the process that you've had to go through? Did, were you contacted by a company or did you go looking for a company? Initially, you know, as far as the wind power deal, we were contacted. They have one wind farm that they developed uh, up close to the Columbia River. This seems to be spreading in this area. What's the reason behind it? Is it, is it the climate? Is it? Well, primarily because we have good wind. They have to have 16 mile an hour average wind 30% of the time to make those turbines economical. You know, we're in that area here. Are you at all concerned with, you know, you're going to go from this beautiful, pristine setting that we're looking at now to potentially seeing, you know, several hundred of white towers posted all over? I am concerned about the aesthetics of the area. The areas that are more eye-pleasing, we have kept those out of consideration for wind development. So you've been able to negotiate quite a lot with yeah. the, the company that's looking at doing the research. Yeah. According to Phil, the first step is for the wind company to put up several test towers for 12 to 36 months. If the data is favorable, then the wind company negotiates long-term lease agreements with the ranchers and the wind towers are installed. These leases can be structured in several ways. It could be set up on a, a set amount per tower, an annual lease per tower, sell a share of the electricity. So one way or another, it's not going to affect anything that you're currently doing. It's not going to affect the cattle or the bed and breakfast or the horses. It's other, just an additional stream of income. You know, I could, I could see uh, maybe some advantage because it's going to put some shade up on these high ridges for cows to lay in. There you go. <laughs> I'm liking that a lot. He's rigging it. He's thinking ahead. The man yeah. is a forward-thinking yes. character. Yeah, I, like I was that. going my cows. They like that shade. They can wander up there and get out of the sun yeah. in the summertime. Yeah, no, I have a fan going. <laughs> Terrific. Phil, Don, I'd love to take a trip up and see where you're about to put these windmills. 
How do we get up there? Well, the easiest way to get up there is horseback. And if you'd like to, we can saddle some horses and head up there. Fantastic. Let's do it. OK. Do you need to get that thing moving a little bit faster, Don? Oh. From the valley to the hills, we travel a little more than 1,100 feet up in elevation across some of the most beautiful country in eastern Oregon. Near the top, I decide to explore the open country and let Don and Phil have a chance to chat. Phil, is this the windiest place on the planet? I think it's got to be close. Does it ever stop blowing here? Not to my recollection. Not ever. So this would be a pretty good place for a wind power station. I think it would be economical to put a wind power station here. Can you give us a good idea of where where these things would go? Would you just put them right here on top you, of the hill? Or? Yeah, normally they'd side them on, on top of these ridges. Uh, and, you know, they they put them out in the pattern uh, to catch a bit of the wind. So how are they going to get them up here? Well, they'll have to build roads in here yeah. to, to do it. They ever drop anything in by helicopter? To my knowledge, no. I haven't. I am. Hi! Oh man, there he is. What the devil are you two up to? You're late yeah. for tea again. Yeah. Yeah. This is heaven's country up here. Yeah. This is heaven. It's just Thank beautiful. You. Phil, do they give you any kind of like an estimation given the amount of land you got? Maybe they could put five on this ridge top right here where we're at. Uh, and then they go to the next ridge top. And so this ridge is across behind us. You know, they could probably site five on it. Maybe 30 to 40 uh, towers that I could envision. Wonderful, sounds like a good opportunity. I think you should have one in your backyard. I should indeed, sir, but it's hard. It's very hard to do that on the cricket field where I live. <laughs> How big are your crickets? How big are our crickets? <laughs> <laughs> Randy. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. You too. You ready? I am. Let's do this. How would you like to see the main control center for us? Fantastic. This here is our skater program and we can control all of our 83 turbines that are out there. These numbers, they keep changing constantly. Mm -hmm. what, is that the power or what is that? That is what's power, how much power is producing right now on each one of those turbines. So what's the average power that you are producing? Um, probably around 300 kilowatts. This is out here is where we keep some of our spare parts. What's, what's this now? This here is a blade bearing. So this goes right at the point where the blade meets the main structure? Right there at the hub, yep. And what about this over here, these two? That there is a generator. So this is the spindle in the minute, can I turn it? Yep. Beautifully engineered, look at that. We have some blades outside if you'd like to take a look. Let's have a look. Okay, here it is. Wow, how long is one of these? One of these are about 20.4 meters long. It looks just like solid concrete, right? Um, no, it's actually made out of fiberglass. And it's safe and it's sturdy up there? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I figure it's time we went up inside one of these. Are you ready for this? I'm ready, all right. Let's go get fit as we're going. First things first, here's a uh, hard hat and safety glasses. Now, how high up are we going? We're going to go about 200 feet up there. Ooh. <laughs> Fit good and snug? Yeah, am I good? Yep, you look good. I think you're ready to go up. Ready to roll. Woo -hoo -hoo! OK, now here it comes. Time for the climb. This thing is moving. It's fun. Well, we're now 200 feet in the air. This is the very, very top of the windmill. Tell me a little bit about what we're looking at in terms of what these parts do. Well, from the front up here is where the blades are going to be spinning, coming into the main shaft. Coming here to this gearbox, which is starting to make the low RPMs become into the high RPMs that turn into the like a, like generator a tra transfer there. transfer box kind of thing. Yep, exactly what it does. It makes that generator spin those speeds to where it'll create the right amount of energy. 
when we were down on the ground before we came up, I asked Randy, what speed are the blades going at? The answer, 120 miles an hour at the very tip. That is a very, very quick rotation. When you're on the ground, it looks like they're moving uh, 10 miles an hour, 20 yeah. miles an hour, 120. Beautiful view out here. This is the hatch at the top. The last time I saw anyone doing this, it was Mike Rowe on Dirty Jobs on Discovery Channel. Well, Mike, an Englishman has done the same thing, pal. Think you're ready for that? Well, Phil Dunn and I'd love to take to... <laughs> <laughs> Phil...